Tato Katoa, uh, kia ora na tato katoa and welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to have you all here this morning, uh, this afternoon, I should say, for this art seat dial te aroa uh, kōrero, lifting the lid on gender bias. We, uh, on behalf of Global Women and Te Taumata Toi a Iwi, who are joint hosts uh, for our kōrero today, really pleased to have the 60 odd people who have uh, registered today to join us and to hear views from this wonderful lineup of speakers. So um, I'm going to, uh, my name is Karen Rangi and I have the pleasure both as a Global Woman member but also as a woman who's uh, strongly interested in the arts through my roles with the Arts Council and the Board of Te Papa. Uh, my job is to facilitate our discussion today and I'm also really looking forward to hearing the, the views of our wonderful panelists here. So I'm keen to introduce each one of them before we hear from them. And I'm going to start with uh, Jill Gatfield. Jill, if you could give us a bit of a wave so everybody knows who's who. Um, so Jill, um, Jill is definitely a sculptor because we were just talking about the fact that right at this moment, Jill is actually while she's with us, she's also supervising a major installation that's taking part in Sydney. Uh, so obviously doing that by remote, and we are just talking about, about how exciting slash petrifying that must be. So she's, uh, she's an author, she's an advocate for equity and intersectoral diversity, so um, really great to have her and her views here uh, today. She's got a background in public policy and law reform. And she brings systems thinking and creative uh, disruption uh, to her mahi. Uh, her award-winning abstract artworks inspire and challenge the status quo, which again is great for our quarter or today, and bringing the values of equity, diversity and inclusion to the forefront um, through the dynamic media of sculpture uh, in the public space. So Jill, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Uh, second in our lineup today is Judy Dara, and Judy plays a significant role um, in the development of art space, um, which will be known for many, to many of you in Auckland. And she recently co-founded and co-curates the, uh, the journal, uh, Femisphere. Her work is exhibited widely, and she's had major collections all over the place, including Christchurch Art Gallery, uh, Te Pono Waifetu, uh, at Te Papa, Auckland Art Gallery, and Govett Brewster Art Galleries. And earlier this year, uh, Judy was awarded an ONZM for her services to the arts and the Queen's Birthday Honours. Congratulations, Judy, and great to have you here with us. Thank you, it's a pleasure. And third in our stellar lineup uh, today is Jane Yong. Jane is the creative catalyst for Taumata Toi Aiwi. She's also an accomplished uh, theatre director and creator. She's a Master of Theatre Arts and Directing from Victoria University down in Wellington and Toi Whakari New Zealand Drama School. And in 2019, she graduated with a Master's in Arts uh, Politics from New York University to School of the Arts uh, on a Fulbright Scholarship. So Jane, welcome to you too. So um, we're going to have some time uh, with each of our panellists to um, hear their views uh, on the topic today, uh, their thoughts, their insights, and um, I just want to encourage all of you who are listening to please feel free to pop any questions into the Q&A as you think of them. And we're going to have an opportunity once we've heard from all of our speakers to pass those questions on and hear their responses. So we're, um, if we're all ready to go, uh, panel, uh, we're going to start today uh, with Jill. And Jill's going to talk uh, about the status of women in the sector, the gender pay gap, barriers to women's progress, uh, systemic bias, and she's going to uh, bring some facts and data that she would like to share with us. Jill, it's over to you. Thanks very much, um, Karen. It's um, a real privilege to be here. Um, and kia ora koutou uh, to our wonderful audience. Um, and I have to acknowledge the expertise um, in the audience because some of those who are listening um, could well be on this panel. So <laughs> we look forward to hopefully you sharing your comments um, and ideas um, in the chat um, and, and um, you know I think I think one of the most important things that we want to um, achieve today is to get as many perspectives out as we can um, so that we can work forward from here to uh, to see what the mahi is um, so I want to share some data um, because I think it's a good starting 
position for us um, to work from an evidence base. And the data that I'm going to share is drawn from primary and secondary sources. Um, and I just want to acknowledge those sources. It's Anna Knox's research last year, um, Fiona Jack um, of the year before, CNZ and NZ on Air, um, Colmar Brunton survey on uh, sustainable careers in the profession, uh, 2019, and some um, data that I've pulled together myself. So I'm going to um, grab your screens and um, bear with me uh, while I figure out how to do this. Okay, so starting with um, the status of women in the sector, we know that women are very highly qualified um, in, in our sector. Um, for over the last 30 years, um, we've got uh, over 65% of the um, graduates for the bachelor's degrees um, across all kinds of creative uh, degrees have been women. And then uh, over that same time period as well, postgraduate degrees, really high proportion of women um, uh, among those graduates. So women are highly qualified um, in the the survey that I just mentioned before, the CNZ ends on air survey, um, formal qualifications of those surveyed was 74%. So, you know, they were really digging into the experiences of a highly qualified group um, when it came to the women um, who participated. And then in some cases, in some universities, there's even higher, um, you know, outcomes where we look at the ELIM stats there uh, so, overall, I guess what we know is that women, generally, we can't break it down intersectionally because we don't have any, any breakdown uh, by ethnicity or uh, disability or LGBTQI+. Plus, we don't, we don't know any more than what we can see here, but we know that overall we've got a highly qualified pool. Uh, so, then we come to looking at income. Um, this is drawn largely from um, what well, it is drawn from the Creative New Zealand New Zealand on air survey, but I've broken it down a little bit differently. So what we see here is that for every dollar that a male um, creative professional earns, overall women in the sector earn 55 cents. So that's a 45% gender pay gap. Uh, that's um, that's pretty high. Um, the national average gender pay gap across all sectors in New Zealand is nine um, percent. So that's a you know a substantial um, difference um, to what we would find in other sectors. When you look at look at it breaking down by age, in the years that women creative professionals would be gaining experience um, and uh, and honing their skills in their art forms in the ages of 16 to 29 and 30 to 39, um, we see that there's still a, a massive pay gap. But it's particularly um, noticeable in that very low um, age group at that outset where the pay gap is, um, you know, is, is, is 32 uh, cents in the dollar. So one of the things about the pay gap um, information that we've found, um, that I've, I've been able to see in international research, is that there's, um, in the dis disability um, area in Australia, they found that um, most of the disabled artists were women um, in surveys that they had done and found that the pay gap was greater. So I think if once we start to look into this deeper, and we might find that it's, there's a difference as to how that, that impact is across um, an intersectional lens. Um, so Auckland Council um, are doing some work at the moment looking at uh, race-based um, differences in pay gap, and they found that there is one for, um, for racial um, gender uh, distinctions, and that's covered in a global women um, panel that was done a couple of weeks ago, and you can access that online. Okay, so this pay gap reduces if you take into account other income. So because creative incomes are so low generally, and in many cases are below a living wage, uh, many in our sector, of course, work outside the sector to supplement their income. 
But in the case of women, the pay gap still stays really high. It reduces down to 25%, but, um, but that's still three times over, or more or less three times over the, the national average. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think we can say, despite the high qualifications of women in the sector, there's some big questions here about why it is that the, um, that the pay is so different or the reward is different. So looking at factors um, progressing, uh, sorry, impacting the progress of women, if we look at domestic responsibilities between women and men in the Creative New Zealand um, survey, they're very similar. About a third of men and a third of women uh, said that domestic responsibilities affected the amount of time that they could dedicate to their practice. So that's unlikely to be a reason then why women are earning so much less. But if we move over to what kind of occupations um, that our women uh, creative professionals are working in, um, these are the lower paid um, in the sector and women dominate those areas at 60%. Now we get into something which is really a question mark, which is about unpaid work. So in, in, the, um, in the Creative New Zealand survey, they found that 50% of those surveyed with less than five years experience were, doing, um, were working in the sector, doing creative work without pay. And we don't know to what extent um, that is being done by women. But we do know that young women, as I said before, in that age group of 16 to 29, that they've got a massive pay gap. So we, we may be able to draw some um, correlation between those two things, that it's probable that those women are working unpaid. Um, there's some very good research done by Museums Aotearoa um, 2018, where they found that um, the volunteers in the museums and galleries um, numbered some 2,700, and that was only data provided by half of the institutions surveyed, and that those people were, if quantified, were made, their work was worth about 3.3 million um, on the basis that they were paid a minimum wage. So we know that we've got a large proportion of our sector are being unpaid, and we don't know to what extent those young women and young men are working to get career experience, to actually to get you know a foot in the door, um, and to you know to get to get the opportunity to be able to start building a career. Um, we start to look then at the representation of women, and just taking um, the visual arts and craft and object to some extent, looking looking a bit deeper at that. Number one there, we've got you know, private gallery representation. This is some data that was collected um, by um, Anna Knox. And that, that's showing us that around a third of those in the private galleries across the country um, are women who are represented by private galleries. Looking at public gallery solo exhibitions, um, again, we've got about 40% you know, of the exhibitions are, um, are of work uh, made by women artists. And we've got, uh, just taking the Auckland Art Gallery as, a, as an example, in the years 2011 to, to 2019, they had only a third um, of their exhibitions were um, women artists only. That doesn't correlate at all to, if we go back to the graduation and the qualification statistics, if we've got over 60% of those um, qualifying um, with degrees, that's not matched even in Auckland alone. If you looked at Elan, which has about 70 to 80% of graduates over that same period and longer, it's not translating into, um, into being on the walls and floors of the gallery. Looking at the, um, the, the city public art collection, um, of the Auckland Gallery number four, you know, they've got 15% um, of the collection, historic and contemporary uh, artworks um, by women. 
The National um, Public Art Collection, oh, this is a secondary source. Um, I couldn't find the data online, but I did find a reference in, um, I think it was in Anna Knox's 2019 second paper, uh, where Te Papa seemed to be having a, a similar rate as um, Auckland Art Gallery, 15% women artists in that collection, not just artworks, so I think it's of all art types. Okay, sculpture parks, um, very similar. These are private public um, sculpture parks across the country, north and south. Um, they are um, permanent um, artworks, so it's about 18% women um, are in our public spaces. This, um, this, there's other data, which you know, I just couldn't keep fitting in. For example, the auction data, there's plenty of evidence um, that women's work is, is underrepresented in auctions and is also um, sells at much lower rates. There's a gender gap there, which is pretty well documented internationally as well. Um, so I, I was feeling very like I needed a highlighter around all of this. <laughs> so um, um, looking at then, just wrapping this up, like systemic bias, you know, what is it? It's a tendency of systems and processes to support particular outcomes. And in this case, we've got, we know we've got a gender pay gap. It looks like it's around 45% if you take creative sector income only. We've got women working in lower paid occupations. We've got women doing unpaid work. We think they're probably doing quite a bit of volunteer work. We've got unequal opportunities and access because we don't have, um, just even in visual arts, we don't have proportion um, of women that even matches their proportion in the population, let alone of their qualifications. We've got unequal representation in the collections. Um, so these things all point to gender bias, so systemic bias that delivers gender bias is where the outcomes favour one gender over others. And all of this leads, of course, to unsustainable careers for women. Um, it also feeds into things like, and these are just examples of funding criteria, where they replicate these outcomes. Um, for example, requiring referees. Well, if you don't get any opportunities, how can you, you know, if you don't have any connections because you're not, you're not getting access to um, having your work presented um, or you're not, you're not able to um, demonstrate um, that you've got um, the capacity, you know, the track record is, is part of, of Creative New Zealand's um, requirement as well. Um, you need to have a venue secured to be able to get funding often, which is difficult if you haven't had, again, um, a track record. It's a bit of a circle. Um, funders tend to be risk averse. Um, they also often look to see if there's other funding um, that supports the additional funding. So this does become um, a bit of a, uh, a vicious cycle. Um, and for women, looking at those statistics, we have to ask the question of whether or not women are being disadvantaged through um, what has become systemic. And then it's replicated through the systems again. Um, student loans, we have, to, we have to look at the impact of student loans on women creatives given their very low income. Um, and the burden being much greater. And, and obviously the work outside the sector, we need to know more about whether or not women choose to work outside the sector or whether that's actually just a lack of, um, of opportunity within the sector and what is the attrition rate. Um, in other sectors, we're aware that in this kind of scenario, there is a, there's, there's usually a really high attrition rate and not by choice. So those are, um, those are my um, opening thoughts. So thank great. you. Thanks, Jill. And um, really great to paint a clear picture of what the facts are telling us and some really great basis there for some key questions that we need to be asking. And so hopefully we can pick that up in the Q&A. Thank you very much. And so uh, we're going to move now on to Jane. Um, Jane's going to tell us a bit about her mahi at Taumata Toya Iwi. Um, the visibility slash invisibility of Asian or people of colour uh, women in the arts and particularly in the theatre space and talk about the barriers uh, of the model minority stereotype. Jane, welcome. 
Kia ora. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Jill. Um, that painted quite a sober picture. That's when that student loan one popped up, that really just resonated with me. <laughs> I was like, oh, there it is. Um, great. I might um, jump off some of those talking points and talk around them as well. Um, so, Tēnā uh, koutou ko Jan Toku Ingoa. Um, I am the Creative Catalyst at Te Taumata Toya Iwi. And um, our main po is in arts advocacy, and that has many streams, and there are many projects that we're working on, so I won't talk about all of them today. But um, one of them is evidence-based research to be used as a tool for advocacy, um, for policy makers, and for visibility for the arts and the creative and cultural sector, and to get engagement. Um, one of the questions we're always asking is, what are the gaps in terms of the research that's been done. What, and you know, Jill, you brought up gaps in research that hasn't been done in government agencies, et cetera. And so we're looking for those gaps as well. And um, one project that came up um, after asking that question is the Moana Oceania project, um, which Karen was at our launch and spoke beautifully at that as well. Thank you for that, Karen. Um, so that is a project that's been spearheaded by Langi Mama um, Academy and Consultancy. And um, asking, so in New Zealand, there are 17 different island nations, and 15 of those are actually in Tamaki Makaurau. Um, and the purpose of the project was to go into these communities and ask, what is art? And for many of these communities, that's not a question that's been asked before. Art isn't necessarily even in that vocabulary. Um, and in terms of the funding models and structures and the way that we think about art, a lot of that is sometimes dictated by very Western modes of, of thought and thought process and structures. And so trying to fit into those boxes and, for example, Pacifica suddenly has to be squeezed into this one box of Pacifica art, even though that might not necessarily be a thing as this research is kind of bringing up, it's bringing up more questions and, and during the Talanoa. And um, this work has really resonated with me in terms of its questions and fluidity as a person who um, is from the kind of uh, diaspora from China. My parents come from Fiji. And so um, essentially the kind of what is art, what is culture, I think specifically has really resonated with me. Um, so this is my shunting segue into kind of visibility and invisibility. Um, there's been a real call recently. There's been a board paper and I will find that and link it. Um, around the need for diverse representation um, and leadership um, in terms of inter intersectional diverse representation, um, particularly as well the underrepresentation of POC women. And, um, you know, we can, we go, why is this happening? And, um, the, and, and how do we mitigate that? And it's, it's a real, we have to contend with the fact that to get on, to get into leadership positions, you have to, um, we have to be able to understand the processes of governance or the processes and structures that are mainly from Western modes of thought. And it gets tricky because a lot of, uh, oftentimes the ask is to come from your own cultural heritage, your own cultural background. And for many first, second gen um, uh, migrant children, um, the culture is not necessarily passed down. And so when someone says to you, um, please bring your cultural heritage to this conversation, I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't help you there. I speak English. I'm, I can't do anything else. Um, and so how to kind of be fluid and weave in between and somehow listen for what other cultures are sort of telling us and, and what our parents can pass down onto us, but it's quite tricky. Um, because uh, we, we start to lack in cultural confidence, um, essentially. And so um, the Moana Oceania project inspires confidence in me because it, it allows people to engage with different kinds of um, thought processes and indigenous thought processes as well and ways of being. And I hope for future generations that will resonate with them as it has with me. Um, yeah. Thank you. 
It's great, great. You know, you raise a really interesting, complex sets of challenges, right? For POC women wanting to break into leadership in arts organisations and the kind of expectation gap, right? Between what you can bring, what you're able to bring, and what you're expected to bring. And yet, I guess another barrier um, to the role of women and being able to be in those spaces. Thanks so much. Um, we've got so much here to talk about and we're only just on to number three. So Judy, um, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Um, I know you wanted to talk about gender issues and representation, um, the role of advocacy and growing women's leadership within the sector. So a really nice segue on from uh, Jane's conversation just now. Welcome. Um, kia ora. Um, I guess um, I'd like to say hello to the audience and thank you for joining us. And it's a really important conversation. And um, for me, um, as a woman artist, I guess I can speak to some of these experiences and observations that I have had as well as I've um, moved through um, university teaching and secondary teaching and art practice um, and a few other things that I've kind of got involved with as well. I'm wearing my high-vis t-shirt to increase the visibility of women's artists so I suggest we all just wear brighter clothes that might work. <laughs> um, so all that what for me what I feel is a lot of these issues come down to language and how women's artists talked about and the language around being an artist, which kind of keeps artists maybe in this slightly fragile, precarious um, position. So as an artist, we talk about making work, we talk about work, I work as an artist. That implies that I get paid, but in actual fact, I don't get paid. Um, it's, I'm, it's sort of, I'm relying on sales or teaching gigs or something. So already there's a problem with the language in terms of work and what we do. Um, a lot of the arts sector and industry, the industry, the everyone above us gets paid, you know, the cleaner at the gallery gets paid. Um, I don't get a wage to be an artist. So I was quite excited by this whole idea of the pace, possibly the artist wage coming back in, but I think post COVID it's a different world now. And so a lot of that has disappeared. Um, I've seen the representation in galleries. I count, I actually go online and I count all the dealer galleries and see how many women there are. Uh, you know, 50-50 would be good at least. Um, I think there was one gallery in Auckland that had one woman at one stage represented. So, you know, all these kind of muteness, this kind of mute or, um, or unaware or unthinking about just the whole issue of having 50% at least. Um, I've seen the, um, Again, you know, the gallery collections, the institutions, and again, women are very, very much marginalised in, in those collections. And it wasn't always like that. Um, apparently in the 19th century, women's art was really visible and there was a lot of support for women artists, that was commissions, et cetera, et cetera. And my thinking and reading is a lot of this has come through 20th century art history in academia and the language around how women's work has been talked about historically the, is different to how uh, a male artist has spoken about. So for example, um, a woman's work might be too colorful or too emotional or um, too bright. So there's this sort of sense that it's too much. Um, whereas, you know, uh, perhaps the, the work of a male artist is important. Um, thrusting, um, what's some other words? Um, you know, we have this thing called the old masters. We don't have the old mistresses. So, so the language is very heavily focused on the canon. And then we even have a canon, oh my God. I mean, how, <laughs> should I talk about that? Um, so I'm always aware of how we talk about women's work and how it's written about and I've seen at universities, I've seen, I've, I've stood in front of a class of postgrad students, 80%, probably more than 80% women and a couple of guys in there, you know, and you, and you say, look, um, you know, think about your representation post this. So it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. Um, uh, I think part of the problem is that artists aren't included in these important con uh, conversations at the middle of how 
we make culture, how we manage culture, how we run our culture. I see it as a pyramid. So um, the artists are at the bottom, we're all the workers working away in the factory, unpaid, and then we get all these structures above us, you know, from government down to institutions, et cetera, et cetera. And none of our conversations are kind of listened to. We, we're kind of kept in this almost infantile state. We're not paid. Um, we're paid very little. We're not paid much. So we're sort of kept in a very a disempowered state, if you like. Um, so um, the whole issue of mothering is a really interesting uh, point as well. I remember, you know, having a kid um, just making art on the kitchen table for five minutes if I had that time. So your processes are different. You don't have that time. Um, a lot of women don't. They give up their practices post um, motherhood. It's too hard. Um, so, um, so there's two things. Um, uh, with Imogen Taylor, we started a thing called Femisphere, which was um, basically, she's a woman artist younger than me. We had a conversation. I realised that everything was the same for her as it was for me. So we made a list of 100 women artists that we could think of in New Zealand and then decided to make the scene. So what we do is we support women's art practice through this very low level um, zine uh, and we go for, you know, diversity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another thing I'm involved with at the moment is Arts Makers Aotearoa, which is a makers union, Arts Makers Union. And this is a push to try and get artists again in the middle of the conversation. So what I would love to see is that everything has a panel of artists on it. So all the institutions, um, all our galleries, everything has like a, a, an advisory panel of artists at least. Um, and so we are feeding into our concerns, all our concerns, our well-being, uh, all our issues are kind of taken on. Um, there was a... Um, uh, back to the language idea, there's that there's a great quote from um, Linda Nochlin who acknowledges, I'll just read it, it's really good. Um, the very position of woman is an acknowledged outsider, the maverick she instead of the presumably neutral one, and that the default artist is the white male position accepted as natural. The authoritative voice is considered to be male and default artist or writer is also easily accepted as thus. So again, there's this, um, the great white male artists has kind of been so imbued and when we think about um, um, art and art making and uh, and that's sort of outside so we need to kind of change that perceptive uh, perception as well within the public um, look at the value of art I think that's really important especially now post-covid I think it's the, the precarious life of an artist has just got more precarious um, we're kind of at that point now where we you know, um, woman, you, you're going to lose your job in hospo, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I just don't know where, where the future is for artists at the moment. I did follow, um, by the way, the CNZ um, COVID batches, the 10 batches that were rolled out week after week to support artists, where artists could apply and get a, a quick response um, funding for a project. And I, I quickly broke it down. There was, in total, in the visual arts, just the visual arts, there were many other categories. There were 44 uh, women applied and were successful, and 21 men were, su were uh, successful. Um, I averaged it out, the male artists got an average of $30,000, and the females got an average of $24,000. This is very crude, it was very round off, but it was just a bit of interesting statistic, current statistic just to um, throw in here at the moment. Um, so, yeah, that's, I think that's me. Um, oh, one last person who is really amazing is Griselda Pollock. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's a, um, a uh, art historian, a British art, art historian. And she, was, she went through art history in the 70s at the same time as feminism. And as a feminist, she was going through this um, art history course, realizing that she was only being taught about male artists by men. Um, so she thought, my God, are there no women artists? And she's done some great research on um, why this has happened. And um, her whole thing is about, again, the use of language and how women's art is described or dismissed as, you know, being, what you know, too female. Yep. Thank you. 
Don't you wish we had another three hours uh, in terms of all the issues that we've got in front of us? So I'm just, um, this is a bit like picking out the really tasty bits out of a smorgasbord and there's so much great stuff to eat. So I'm only going to pick a couple. Um, I guess the first thing from me, from what I've heard from the three of you, is it is the starkness of the facts. And if I think about the slides that Jill put up, it raises a whole lot of questions with the one of the fundamental ones being if we've got so many highly qualified women in the arts, um, then why isn't that manifesting itself in a more equitable uh, pay level? Um, that's one thing. And she raises um, lots of particular reasons why that could be so. Um, I guess the second thing for me is thinking about uh, the place of women in leadership and how women get there and how skills, experience, uh, views, world views are recognised and valued, if they are valued. I guess the third point for me, um, and I'm thinking um, just your whole issue around the language and the narratives that we have around, again, around the value of women, um, if we're even having those kinds of narratives uh, in the sector. And so I think it raises for me, um, so as a, as a person who sits on a couple of boards of, of large arts organisations, I'm thinking about the questions that I should be asking myself and my colleagues, right? And so one of them is around, is around the... Have we got the most strategically significant, diverse range of views around the board table? And by strategically significant, I mean the range of views that we need in order to serve the people that we're serving. So that's one of the questions that I'm asking. And bearing in mind that uh, the boards I'm on are, are picked by ministers, and there's a really interesting question here that I'm going to uh, just pick up in the Q&A shortly. Um, the second question it asks me is that, um, do I think we've got a clear picture of the extent to which uh, women, particularly women artists, uh, are featuring, are leading, are playing a role in the wider sector? Do we know that? Are we even asking the questions? And finally, and this is um, one I'm really interested to pick up after this, is actually how are we capturing the voices and views of artists? So we have artists ex exhibit in our organisations, but how are we capturing their thoughts over and above the exhibition or the piece of work and feeding that back into important leadership conversations? Um, it already tells me I've got lots of work to do. So um, thank you for those initial thoughts. I'm going to um, open it up, but we've got a few questions coming through. Um, before we come back to you, uh, the three of you, with just some thoughts around thoughts, solutions on the issues that you have raised. So I'm going to pick up, um, so the very first question we've got here, um, and I'm thinking it's probably for me, so I'll have a go at, at answering it, but it's the question from Jenny Prisk is, what's the female representation status on arts boards in New Zealand? And with our Prime Minister and the Honourable Grant Robertson, being Ministers of Arts and Culture, and of course we've got Minister Carmel Cipolloni as well, so we've got three Ministers in the Arts. What are their positions on leveraging the importance of women in the arts? So that second question you'll have to ask them, but just on the first one, um, so in terms of the Arts Council of New Zealand, we have seven men and six women, and on Te Papa, we have one, two, three, four women and three men. So fairly even Stevens there, but I guess um, you might want to start thinking your way around some of the other arts boards uh, in the country as well. But it's a really great question to be asking the ministers. What are their positions, given that two of them are women there? Um, we've had a question here from um, the lovely Alison Taylor from Taumatatua Aiwi. Um, and so I'm opening this up to the panel. And Jill, you started to reflect on this in your slides. The question is, do you think there are differences depending on the genre of arts, for example, performing arts versus film, music, theatre, et cetera? So I might start with you, Jill. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, well, in the visual arts, which includes um, 
uh, actually film um, making. Um, that's the statistic that I, I presented, um, which showed that um, you know, women are overrepresented in that, and that's one of the lower paid sectors. The CNZ ends it on air um, survey breaks it down. So I, I suggest that you go there um, and look, look at, that, at that report. It's a really good piece of work. Um, it could probably, um, if it's possible, do with being broken down again by gender and where possible by ethnicity, because um, there's a number of questions that would be answered just by running that data through. In terms of the performing arts, um, Jane may have a, um, a thought on that. Um, I think that might be more, you know, like in terms of the theatre side of that, Jane, you may have, a, um, have a, an idea. The art forms, you know, obviously within each, oh, well, actually one, inter sorry, one interesting really thing that, that is noticeable about the pay um, differential in terms of what sector or type of art form that you're working within is the, the ones that are more closely aligned to the STEM areas, which is science, technology, engineering, and of course medicine, where men dominate um, in, in those roles within the creative um, realm, uh, they're the better paid work. And so, you know, we see the same kind of outcome um, within the creative sector that we see across other sectors, where those doing the STEM work, which are, in this case, again, uh, mostly men, are paid better. Thanks, Jill. Just um, comments from either you, Jane or Judy? In terms of um, payment and the performing arts, um, it's, it's really tricky, like, no, um, I was doing some research for Wellington City Council earlier this year, um, just trying to break down how much um, sort of gig artists get paid, because um, especially in the performing arts, it's really about having a portfolio of opportunities, and um, data collected by um, uh, Statistics New Zealand doesn't necessarily privilege that kind of research, um, and so I hope that in future there will be some kind of research around this as well and then with the breakdown of between men and women. Um, in terms of payment, to be honest, like a lot of it isn't discussed and also when I was working in the public sector and the public service, it isn't discussed as well and I know um, uh, Julianne Genta, um, Minister for Women, was pushing for um, having salaries um, you advertised and put on um, uh, job applications and interviews. And I, but I definitely know that um, for several positions that are, where I've been interviewed for in the past and that, and people say, you know, uh, what is your salary expectation? And I don't know what to say. Um, and it's interesting because talking to my partner about it, who is a man, always says, he, he says, ask higher. And he says a lot of women come in and they don't, um, and he works in the public sector and they don't ask for hire, men do all the time. Um, and as an artist, it's almost even more tenuous because sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, I'm getting paid, thank you so much. Whereas, and that's not necessarily how we should be, we should be negotiating for um, proper rates. And something that, um, I'm, I've been working with Joe Randerson quite a lot and we're really campaigning around living wage for artists. So. Um, when we're trying to do our budgets for shows and things like that, living wage for everyone. So in terms of that, um, so trying to make everything sort of even and across forms, um, sorry, across roles within a production as well. So again, doesn't really answer the question, but at the same time just shows how like fractured um, the, the, the creative sector and industry is in terms of trying to get a hold of this kind of, um, this data and research. Great, thanks Jane. Judy, any thoughts from you? Um, I guess just, a, um, <laughs> this is always amusing when um, you get asked to do an, an, an artist talk or go into a university and do an artist talk. So you prepare for, you know, a couple of hours and then you speak and give up three hours of your day and then they give you, you're handed a petrol voucher. It used to be a book voucher from Parsons, that was great. Um, it's kind of like, you know, you work, work for food or petrol. So there's this sort of dislocate about, um, not being rewarded for any work you've done, et cetera, et cetera. And that's sort of a structural thing in university. So I always find that a bit of a, um, <clears throat> a bit disturbing. Um, I think for me, I, I do remember the PACE scheme, um, which was um, a, a sort of an artist's doll that was probably, again, not framed in the right language. 
Um, so um, for me, you know, something like Jane was saying, where um, if artists are being paid, and therefore they're being valued. So it sort of goes hand in hand, you know, you get paid, you get valued, because that's how we, we measure value in our communities. So um, yeah, I think that's just my thoughts. Mm. Thank you. Um, we had an interesting question here from Dawn Hutchinson, and she's pointing out what she sees as being the disparity between the way that women are funded in community or not-for-profit arts organisations versus, say, public sector organisations, local or central government. And that, again, there seems to be another, uh, this is a gap of, a, of another variation, right? Um, and she's got some really great suggestions there about, um, for some of us like funders, how we could help to... Uh, to reset that balance. But I'm just interested if, if any of you have any observations of those gaps between organisations that you wanted to share? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I, one of the things that I, I think is occurring here is that in the public sector, there is a lot of transparency and accountability around, um, you know, pay rates, well, increasingly around pay rates, but particularly around appointments and, and um, promotions and there's consideration to boards so for example the boards that you referred to that you're on um, Karen that what happens in the private sector is that the legislation doesn't reach as deep um, and it's you know optional to to report or to to um, to calculate um, how you're actually performing um, so I think one of the things that perhaps, you know, Dawn is, is touching on here is that once you get outside the public sector, um, equity is something which is much more negotiable. It's not actually um, an, an outcome that's required. And I really think that we need to start to see that change across, across all of our sectors anyway. But in the arts sector, it just has this deeper impact because it's an already underfunded sector. Um, you know, and I think also things like, you know, the legislation that requires, just in the case of, of um, Creative New Zealand, that it needs to take direct um, notice of and, and to promote uh, Toi Māori and Pacific Arts, which are, are very appropriate um, uh, parts of the kaupapa of the organisation, but it doesn't have the same requirement to um, deliver outcomes uh, by gender or by diversity in general. So it's these kinds of, I think, things which have been just left to sit, um, but now obviously are not producing the right kinds of results and, and women and minorities generally uh, are being done disservice. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's a bit of an overhaul. We need to look at the bigger picture um, and where the arts sector is sitting in that picture. Thank you. I'll just see if Jane and Judy have got any comments on Dawn's um, point that she raises. Nothing from you, Judy. How about you, Jane? Um, kia ora for the, quest, uh, the thoughts, Dawn. I was just reading them again. I kind of love the idea of a, a top-up, but also how do we kind of solve that structural inequality alongside alongside that as well and um, to, to, to kind of come at it from both ways. And I was thinking about what Judy was saying about language and the importance of language and, and sort of what we get taught in schools about women and the place of women in society, just coming back to that huge question again, women in society. And um, I had this one student a long time ago when I was teaching, um, a beautiful student who, who just, who didn't sort of realize, but wrote in um, the essay, from the beginning of time, women have been inferior. And it totally wasn't what they were trying to say. But from all of the, the canon, the kind of the, the men dominated canon that we have, we have it in theater as well. The, 20, uh, the 20th century was not kind to women um, artists. And um, so just thinking about how we can change these uh, thoughts around, the, around women and, and pay and equity um, from when we start school, yeah. So, hanging on to that thought then, um, the next conversation I'm keen for us all to have actually is, if these are the problems that we are, we are seeing, right, these are the issues um, out there in our arts sector, what do we think are some of the solutions? What are some of the ideas we've got around solutions? And 
we're going to go back in, in the order of our um, of our that our panelists uh, spoke. Um, so, just asking each of you to share um, your particular thoughts and solutions on the areas that you raised. Actually, we're going to go in reverse. How's that? We're going to start with Judy, who luckily has just run back into the room. I saw that sprint there. <laughs> so, just Judy. Um, yeah, just keen to hear a couple of your thoughts, solutions on how we fix some of the issues that you've raised, particularly around language and the narratives that we're hearing. Well, I think it's just an awareness, you know, it's an awareness of, oh, maybe that word, maybe I should change that word or um, pointing stuff out, you know, when you're reading stuff or what people say. Um, I think, like I said before, my biggest thing is getting creatives and artists at the center of the conversation so we are in the middle and everything is coming from us another thing is um arts education um i don't know if you've noticed it's it's steam it's stem not steam at the moment so science te technical english math there's no art in there so um when i was an art teacher i I was one of the, I went through that generation where we had art at school and it was compulsory, et cetera, et cetera. And now suddenly art has just fallen, fallen, fallen through our education system to the ground. So if we can bring it back up, talk about art, have these conversations, people, kids are making art, that it's, it's about well-being, it's about, you know, the joy of making, et cetera. That will kind of increase the, um, the um, people will notice art more, you know, and I think it'll be less intimidating perhaps. Um, so yeah, for me, it's um, education and artist visibility over all these structures. Great, thank you very much. Um, Jane, what's your thoughts? How do we fix this? Well, how do we fix this? I definitely agree with Judy, especially in terms of language and arts education. Um, I think it's, to, I think something around giving people courage and giving women courage to get up and, and, and do things their way and kind of go like, what is my way of leading? What is my way of being in this world? And not going, oh, that's, that's kind of not what we expected or that's not right or that doesn't fit with the status quo because it won't. It'll, it'll be weird. It'll be all over the place. It'll be eclectic, like the office behind me, who, which belongs to a very incredible woman. And um, just kind of going, how do we break down some of these barriers of what we think is normal and what we think is good thought leadership and what we think is good um, strategy, but actually going, how can we think outside the ways that we're being taught, that we get taught to think. Um, and I think that also comes into play when we start thinking about government and politics and policy. And um, when we think about funding and we think about those strategies, when we think about programming for galleries, is how can we think complete, how can we just kind of play with it a little bit more and be a little bit freer and have the courage to to fail as well in that, yeah. Thanks, Jane. Jill, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with um, both Judy and, and Jane's um, comments. Um, I guess I, I also think that we need to see um, systemic um, issues tackled and, and to have um, institutional leadership um, there's a lot that falls to artists and to artist collectives um, and to NGOs and, and to, you know, underfunded um, community, you know, organisations to, to try to support the arts and the arts, you know, as we, we all agree, you know, are a fundamental part of our culture and in building culture and understanding it and also in disrupting it in, in the context of Black Lives Matter and the colonial monuments debate alone, you know, the contribution of artists to that discourse is, is really, really valuable. And we need diverse voices in that conversation among others. Um, we need, we need um, artists on our boards, not just our arts boards, on all of our boards because of the creative thinking and the, the, the disruptive approach that artists can bring is often innovative and we need innovation in these COVID times. 
I think it's part of our, our you know, unique um, position in Aotearoa that we have such an incredibly um, brilliantly diverse, uh, you know, pool to draw from. And I really want to see artists being um, enabled in that. So I'd really like to see these systemic problems addressed. I, I'd like to see data um, gathered by the organisations who are responsible um, for, for delivering and for serving um, artists and creative professionals as clients, as people, you know, as, as citizens. Um, I'd like to see diversity policies. New Zealand On Air has been very proactive in this um, area, um, Creative New Zealand less so. Its last diversity policy was 2015. I think it's two pages long. Um, I don't think it has any outputs. You know, it, it's, a, it's a statement, but it's not an action. We need to really see um, some really good thinking and a plan, a sector plan, on how we actually address um, the current position for, for women and intersectional um, artists, creatives, because if we don't do it now, we're gonna end up with a lot less and it's gonna be really fragile um, going forward. So I'd like to see us work with more, not less. I think we, you know, the whole, whole sort of discussion ends up being, what do you take away from men um, or, you know, what do you take away from Pākehā? You know, it's, it's, that's not the conversation. The conversation is how do you actually expand all of the opportunities and all of the um, resources and then es ensure that, you're, um, that we are coming up with, with outcomes that produce um, equitable results for everybody. Um, you know, there is plenty. It's not less. I think there's more. Um, thank you to you all. And I've just I've been reflecting on your thoughts about the solutions going forward for fixing the gaps that we can clearly see, for lifting the visibility, um, for changing the narratives, so we lift the value of the contribution of women alongside men to the arts, and. Um, I, I take all of your point that actually this is not a, this is an ecosystem responsibility, right? Um, for everybody who's involved to play their particular art. And so it's not just landed on the artists to be doing that for themselves, but for all of us to be doing it for, you know, for the arts. Um, as I said earlier on, I wish we had another three hours to kind of dive into each of the areas that you've, you've raised because they're all particularly important. And I really appreciate um, both Global Woman and Tomata Toyaumi for making this, this space today to at least raise the conversation. And I guess I send out the challenge um, to those who are listening who come from arts organisations and to my own organisations that I'm involved in for us all to be asking the questions around what we understand about where there is inequity, um, about how we see diversity and how we consciously and actively uh, address that. And around actually, how do we value the people um, that are producing arts for us? Um, and how do we value, not, not just from the point of view of providing exhibition space, which is really important, but value in terms of taking their thoughts, views into the bigger leadership discussions um, that we have. So I, um, as I say, I don't know where the hour's gone, but it's gone. Um, and I really want to thank uh, Jill, Jane and Judy um, for your time, for sharing your, your frank thoughts with us. Um, it is a privilege for us to hear people's frank thoughts and none of us take that lightly. Um, I've certainly got um, plenty of food for thought myself for my own organisations that I'm involved in. But I also want to wish all three of you the best on your continuing journey um, into the arts and, and thank you for your contributions so far. And um, I think we've all got a responsibility, all of us listening, to be thinking about our role in this space and what we do. And finally, just before we wrap up, I can see we've still got questions and comments uh, coming through. So um, and thank you for the thank yous and for the acknowledgement. There's a massive vote there for STEAM. And um, I think, again, another conversation to be having with our politicians about, about STEAM, not just STEM. Uh, and I'm hoping that people have taken away their own thoughts and actions. 
So thank you again to our panellists. Thank you very much to our audience for, for tuning in today. And again, thank you to Global Woman and to Taumata Toya Iwi for making this time for this really important conversation. Hey kona.